Oh, Westgate, great to be with you. A joy to be back. This is very much for me. I know many of you don't even know who I am, but hi. Uh, but this is very much for me a homecoming, and it feels a little bit like uh, a college student coming home only to find that their parents did a massive addition to the house, you know, and now you got South Hills and also, I don't know, it's the same feeling of, you know, coming back and realizing that your room is no longer your room, but they turned it into a gym, you know, and so I saw my office that I used to office out of, and there's like four people crammed in there because God's doing amazing, amazing stuff here. I, I thought before we begin, for those of you who don't know me, don't know uh, a little bit about who I am, I thought I'd just kind of share a picture of my family. I'll tell some stories about them, and then you'll actually believe me that I do have a family. Uh, that way. And so you can see, and I know the very first thing that comes to mind uh, when you see this is, yes, indeed, we are um, very Swedish. Thank you very much. That is true. And so then you see uh, my beautiful wife right there, Jenny. We've been married just under 13 years. I have an 11-year-old daughter um, going on 17, and it's freaking me out. Uh, and then there's Ryder, and I love Ryder. He just tells his mind. I mean, the other day we're driving in the car, and he said, Dad, when you die, I don't know why he's thinking about when I die, by the way, but dad, when you die, uh, will I get your allowance? Um, so he, he is a planner and he is prepared. And then there's Miles and we just call him Miles of Smiles. He is the absolute uh, best, not the best. I don't have favorites. I just enjoy him a lot. Thank you very much. Anyways, that's my family, and we started out three years ago uh, on this church planning adventure. We meet at Del Mar High School. We have two morning services. We do the whole church in a box, back the trucks up, set up, tear down. For the first couple years, um, I mean, it was insane. It was crazy. Uh, staff meetings happened in my house. Church meetings happened in my house. Uh, when we went to go change, you know, like organize our box trucks, we have a bunch at box trucks. It happened in my house. My neighbors kept thinking we're moving, you know, because we would just bring these trucks and like, oh my goodness, are you moving? Thankfully, they weren't like, you're moving, you know, that was, that was good. That was good. Uh, but it's only been in the last year where I feel like we've really hit our stride as a community. We're, we're more healthy. Uh, we're seeing God grow. We're seeing new people come to know Jesus. And uh, it's just awesome. I, this has been, you know, the stage of life of my kids is one of the funnest stages I've ever experienced. And then the stage in life where a church is awesome. And this last summer, it was the first time in probably three or four years we were able to get away. And like, you, you know the time when you're able to get away and just like, oh, and just be, and you didn't, you, you didn't, you know, we weren't walking in all the previous vacations we'd had up to then, we're kind of limping in, kind of just trying to get up the snuff, you know, you have a vacation just to get past E, you know. This was one where we're just like, oh, and my in-laws have a beach house in Santa Barbara, which is amazing as a pastor, we get to go, you know, for free vacation. And so I took my family down there and uh, we we're hanging out at, at the house and our good friends, Josh and Daniel Fox and their family who leads worship at South Hills, they were driving up from a, visiting their brother and they stopped in to see us. Uh, and, and Jenny sent me out, my wife sent me out on an errand because we had guests coming in to go grocery shopping. Now, when I get sent out on errands, normally I come back with a lot more than what was on the list. And so she said, stay on the list. I said, okay, I'll stay on the list. I'll, I'll just do the list. And so she sent me out um, and she wanted me to get some of her favorite sparkling water. And I got that and we needed some chips. And so I got that. Uh, and then we got some um, bread because we had a bunch of kids and they needed that. And then, okay, we needed paper towels. And by the way, really important when you have guests to have toilet paper. Uh, and so I got that and I get up to the register uh, and the guy asked me, do you need a bag? And I looked at that and said, no, nah. <laughs> I got it. I'm good. Uh, now, the thing is, I'm in Santa Barbara, and I grew up in Santa Cruz, so I'm a beach kid. I love being in beach attire. In fact, if I could, I'd preach in board shorts and a t-shirt. That would be amazing. But that particular day, I'm wearing board shorts with no pockets. So in my hand, I have my wallet, my keys, my phone, and then now I'm taking on these things right here, and I get all this up, 
and I'm starting to walk out. And as I walk out of the store, um, I don't know why these guys are just hanging outside a grocery store, but they're just sitting chilling. And, and I start to get nervous because now I got an audience, you know, as I'm carrying all this stuff and I'm starting to lose the toilet paper. And Lord knows you don't want to lose toilet paper. And so as I'm walking, it's literally slipping out of my hands and I do everything in my power to save the toilet paper. And I do only to see in slow motion what happens next. And I swear to you, it happened in slow motion. Time stopped and moved just incrementally. I watched my phone begin to do this. Boom, boom, boom. And then I said this. No. And then there was no more. And I stood there with the toilet paper in my hands and my phone on the ground. I just went stupid, stupid, stupid. As I'm looking at what I worked so hard to make sure didn't fall, and I think to myself, self, toilet paper bounces. Phones do not. In fact, there's a plastic covering, so even if it did fall, it wouldn't even get dirty. And I picked up my phone, and some of you have had it. It was so shattered that you couldn't answer the phone without bleeding in your ear. You've had that before, some of you I know. And in that moment, one simple yet significant question rose to the forefront. And I, I think for some, this question is the question that uh, the reason God has you here. I think personally, this question it is what God wants to maybe encourage or maybe challenge or redo something afresh in your life. And it's the question that I believe we have to ask as a church as well. We have to ask this question. It's simple. It's obvious. But it's also incredibly important and significant. The question is, what is it that I can't afford to let fall? I mean, personally... Think about it. What is it that you can't afford to let fall? You can't afford to let drop to the ground the things that you go, you know what, there's a few things in my life. Everything else seems so important and we're juggling all these things in life, aren't we? But what are the few things that are in your arms that are entrusted to you that you go, you know what, I can't let this Fall. And we all know why this is important. We've all seen why this is important because misplaced priorities always lead to misspent lives. And it's easy to see in everyone else, but it's hard to see in yourself because everything in our arms feels so important. But misplaced priorities lead to misspent lives. We know it to be true. Another way to say it is, is when you overvalue the wrong thing, you end up under investing in the right thing. When you overvalue the wrong thing, we, got, we prioritize everything. You end up, and we've seen it, we've watched people who end up with toilet paper in their hands, but the most important things, the most important people in their life are broken and fragmented on the ground. In fact, um, I was out to lunch with a, a buddy in our church, a great guy, uh, and he's an exec in one of those Fortune 500 companies, and he's been going strong, leading his arm of the company and growing it by millions and millions and all these dollar signs, and I'm like, I don't even know what that means. I've never, I mean, those are just all fragments of imagination to me, but those are realities to you. Thank you. Uh, and we're sitting, and he has been a go-getter, like nonstop, travels at least two-thirds of the year, and finally, his company, he was two years past the sabbatical, said, you have to take a sabbatical. And so he takes a sabbatical with his family. He came back and he said, you know, Ryan, some things need to change. Some things need to change because I realize I can grow my company to X and in the process miss out on my kids growing and not have influence and impact and miss who they are and who they get to be. I can grow this, and as a result, and for some of you this morning, this is why this is so crucial, this is why this is so important, is for some of you, your marriage is in midair, and it's 
For some of you, it's with your kids. For some of you, it's even with yourself. And sometimes, isn't it true that a change of pace gives us perspective? And for others of us, we, we know the consequences because pain, pain always reveals priority. And some of you have experienced the pain of letting some important things fall and realize I'm holding on to the wrong thing. So for you, this morning, what is it that you can't afford to let fall? Now, I want to switch gears with you for a second and spend the, most of the time asking it, this question just a little differently. Have you ever thought about, for us as the church, and now when I say the church, I'm not talking about this building, I'm not talking about this location, we're Westgate, we know what the church is, it's not the church, the building, we are the church, the church is a people who come together, and so when you leave, the church actually leaves, the church is on the move, when you walk outside those doors, and wherever you go, church is happening, that's what I'm talking about when we're talking about the church, just to be clear, have you ever asked this question? What is it the church can't afford to let fall? Have you ever wondered what is the thing that, that we have to go, no, 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 we can't afford to let that hit the ground. There's other things that maybe we argue about. There's other things that we like. There's other preferences that we have. But at the end of the day, we don't want to be, in, as a church, holding on to toilet paper when the most important thing falls to the ground. Now, I want to argue that the entertainment industry has answered that question with absolute clarity and is moving forward with confidence and conviction. I argue to you that the tech industry has asked and answered that question with absolute clarity, conviction, and then is putting their money where their mouth is. And in fact, if you look at today's marketing and where the lion's share of all marketing, you'll see what everybody else seems to be absolutely aware of. What is it we can't afford to let fall? And when you look at the tech industry, when you look at entertainment, when you look at marketing, you know what their answer is? This generation. In fact, in fact, another way to say it is, is what is this generation worth? And when you look at the tech industry, they literally put their money where their mouth is. Think about Facebook. Some of you have heard of this small little company called Facebook, and some of you work there. But Facebook, a year ago, literally put a dollar amount to what this generation is worth and what they can't afford to let fall. A year ago, they spent a sum of money on a singular app. The app's called WhatsApp and that all the teens were going, because here's what Facebook knew. They're losing teens by the drove, and the teens are the future of their company, and they can't lose the teens. So what are they going to do? They're going to do whatever's necessary to recapture the teens. So they're going to go where they go, and they're just going to buy it up, basically. That's what they can do. And they did. The WhatsApp app, by the way, in 2014, grossed $10 million and lost $250 million. Facebook paid $19 billion for it. So when you ask, what is a generation worth to Facebook? Their answer, $19 billion. And so all of a sudden, we have to begin to step back as a church, as the stewards of the greatest news this planet has ever heard, as followers of Jesus and say, okay, what is this generation worth? And, and let me maybe ask it this way. What's at stake if we don't? What's at stake if we don't? What's at risk if we don't answer that question with absolute clarity and conviction that moves us, that propels us to action? In fact, I think we find out what's at stake if we don't in this, this book, this ancient Hebrew writing uh, of Judges. 
And here we have a couple hundred years after Joshua went into the land. And let me give you a little backstory so that uh, you can kind of pick up where this, this commentary, where the people of Israel are. And it really is, I think, an accurate commentary of our day today. Uh, and so the, co- the backstory, for those of you who don't know, is Israel was in Egypt. They were in bondage. They were enslaved for 400 years. They cried out, God, save us. And then God raised up a deliverer to, and Moses and said, let my people go in it. No, okay, no, okay. Whatever. You weren't going there with me, but Moses went there. And then they eventually, through some conflict and whatnot, led the people of Israel out. 40 years in the desert, he's leading the people, then passes the baton of leadership to Joshua. They enter into the promised land. God does amazing miracles through an incredible military campaign. They see God use them, and now they're settling the land of promise. And this is written a couple hundred years after that Time And it is a commentary of what happened when you don't answer this critical question well. Listen to what uh, Joshua chap- or Judges chapter 2 says. It says, The people served the Lord throughout the lifetime of Joshua and the elders who outlived him and, and who had seen all the great things the Lord had done for Israel. After that, a whole generation had been gathered to their ancestors. Another generation grew up who neither knew the Lord nor what he had done for Israel. Then, as a result of that, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. They forsook the Lord, their God, of their ancestors, who had brought them out of Egypt. They followed and worshipped various gods of the people around them. What's at stake if we don't? And you see, actually, in this text, there's three generations. And the first generation was Joshua's generation. The first generation, they knew and they experienced God. The first generation, they're the ones that were coming out of the desert. They took steps into the Jordan, and the water stopped. They marched around Jericho, and as they were marching, the walls fell down. They got to see God show up and work. And then there's a second generation. It's the, it's the kids of that generation. It's the ones that were brought along, the ones who got to walk with their parents, but they didn't march around the city, and, and they didn't walk through. They, they got to see their parents step out in faith, but their parents settled the land, and they grew up in a settled land. And so they knew of God, but they didn't experience God. The second generation knew of God, but didn't experience God. And then it says there's a third generation. See, the first generation of faith steps out, sees God working, but then the baton wasn't passed well where the next generation really had to live on faith. They just simply lived by the faith of their parents. And the third generation neither knew God or experienced God. And I'd like to argue that that pattern is what we're currently experiencing in America today. Uh, take a second with me and just look at the generational breakdown, if you will, uh, of our, our current culture. And, and, we, and the first generation we'll talk about is the baby boomers. And we got any baby boomers in here? Anybody excited to be a baby boomer? Any voices? I know arms. Any like, whoo? Okay, we got it. Ah. Um. <laughs> Don't kill me, please. Thank you. Uh, but baby boomers, and, and you know what? Uh, we have baby boomers, and by the way, you know, your parents post-war got busy with it, and so there was a boom in the babies. And so for decades and decades, you have been the largest generation, most influential generation in our society. Then came another generation, the Gen Xers. Any of us, you know, I'm in that category. Any Gen Xers? Okay, yeah, pretty excited. Whew. Now, here's the reason they're not excited, because Gen Xers don't want to be labeled. When they go to uh, labeling, uh, you know, these, they generally look back and then find a label. They kind of give a label at the front and then go back. And us Gen Xers, we just thought we'd take the X, because we don't want to be labeled. And, and we're a little bit disgruntled and, you know, but uh, and probably still are. And then today we have millennials, the millennial gen. We have any millennials, you know? I like that. Um, that was great. Hey, hey, by the way, did you know that of, as of 2015, the largest generational demographic in the USA today are millennials? Baby boomers, you got outpassed. Now, we, we don't want to talk about why. There's some sad facts about that. 
But, but let me go back real quick. See, with the baby boomers, it wasn't just the boom of babies. There was actually a boom of God. And we forget when we look back on church history, but, but, but 30 years ago, the, the, the pundits, the people were saying, by the way, the church is gone. The church is dying and, and, and it's obsolete. And then there was a Jesus movement. And some of you came to know Jesus through the Jesus movement. And then there was people who began to rethink how to do church. And we're in a church today because baby boomers had the courage to step out and do church differently. We have drums today because of baby boomers. We have the arts back in the church because of baby boomers. I know Gen Xers like to claim it, but it started with the baby boomers. We are experiencing the afterglow of the movement of God and faith of what happened in the baby boomer generation. But I'd argue that the same generational, the first generation knew God and experienced God, the Jesus movement. Second generation knew God but did not experience God. The third generation neither knew God nor experienced God. And I'd argue argue that the millennials are right there. Do you know that the fastest growing demographic in the Silicon Valley is the millennials. Did you know that those millennials in the church, by age 23, 70% of them will leave the church? Did you know that in the Silicon Valley, that there's just, just not Silicon Valley, let's just take San Jose, because Silicon Valley is massive, 3.9 people. Silicon Valley, you know, just a million people, that's it, just, just a million, not a big deal. Over 100,000 people just between the ages of 18 and 25 in the Silicon Valley millennials. Just that small gap. That doesn't even cover the whole thing. Less than 2% of them are reached. Which, by the way, if you take any mission uh, agency kind of uh, mathematical equation for an unreached people group, the millennials in the Silicon Valley qualify as an unreached people group. You don't have to go around the world. You can start right here to reach a people who do not know Jesus. And then, and, then, and then there's this group. And this is the group that my kids are growing up and many of your kids are growing up in. It's the I generation. They're growing up with a, with, in a post-Christian era. They're growing up in a world, they're the I generation because they're, they're a culture that has never not known technology. They, they've never experienced, beep, 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 you know, they never knew that. <laughs> they never knew that. They've always known a socially connected world. See, the question, the question for you, the question for me, the question for the church is what is it the church can't afford to let fall? The answer is Oh, three of you are with me. Thank God. Man, that's some good preaching right there. When you get three with you, mm, man, makes me feel so good. Love it. Thank you very much. Okay, we'll try it again and, and we might have four. Um, the, the question. It is a hard question. No, I, I get it. I've only been talking about um, 23 minutes on it. Um, I'm, I'm sure I haven't repeated myself enough. The question is what is it the church can't afford to let fall? It's generation. What is the missing gap in the church currently today? This generation. See, the reason we planted Awakening Church was to answer that question. And at some point, you have to answer the question that Facebook answered. What is this generation worth to you? Is it worth doing some things differently? Is it it worth changing some methods? See, the message of the gospel never changes, but our methods are always changing. Is it worth, you know, maybe not having the color carpet that you want? Is it worth maybe not having everything look so the way you want or the music the way you like? By the way, the greatest music for you is the music that you came to know Jesus on. 
That's why Delirious is the greatest band in the world. And by the way, my heroes in the church are those of you who think the music's too loud, too rocky, and you come here anyways with a good attitude because you care about the next generation, and we need more of you. You're my heroes. And I tell our church all the time, one day, someday, I'm not going to like the music in our church. And that's okay because it's not about me. We're about awakening this generation to new life. I want to talk for a second to those that are in this generation. Just, just a simple word to you. And if you're a teen, if you're a 20, you, you've been labeled. You've been labeled by us. You've been labeled as the me generation, the selfie generation. In fact, my brother, who's hiring a lot of this generation, he's like, it's the trophy generation. I said, what do you mean by that? Well, all of them growing up got a trophy for whatever they did. They're entitled. <laughs> I say, yeah. yeah. Hey, let, let me say this. Oftentimes, and this is true for you and me, and think about this. Oftentimes, we live up to and live out the labels we've been given. What if we as a church began to call something greater out of this generation instead of labeling them? So think about this, teens. Think about this, 20s. Come on. When God wanted to bring about a change, think about this, so good. He often chooses and uses teens. Because some of you are thinking one day, someday, and part of that's our fault as a church. We got to own that because we said, you know what? You go over there in that corner and do your own thing because we don't like how it disrupts our thing. But when God wanted to do something, change the world, he often chooses and uses teens. I mean, mean, think about it. When when God God wanted to save the the people of Israel, bring restoration and, and healing to a nation, the nation of Egypt, he called an arrogant dreamer named Joseph, who was a teenager, and replaced it with a God sized dream. When God wanted to restore, think about this when God wanted to restore the kingdom of Israel and put it back on path, he went to a house and looked not for the older boys, but the young shepherd boy. He wasn't even invited to the table at the first one. They said, there's got to be one more. And God anointed and appointed this shepherd boy named David to lead the kingdom. And maybe we should start inviting the shepherd boys to our table to have an influence and be able to... Yeah, amen, yeah, okay. When God wanted to save his nation from the brink of extinction of a genocide, you know what he did? He raised up and put into a position of influence and affluence a teenage girl and saved the name. And her name is Esther. When God wanted to accomplish his purposes and his plans, think about this, so good. In the midst of a hostile culture of Babylon, He raised up four teenagers because no one else had the guts to stand up and stand out for God. But four teens did, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. When God wanted to save uh, the humanity and bring about the salvation of the world, he entrusted the greatest gift this planet has ever known to a teenage girl named Mary. And when God, when God, come on, come on, come on. Think about this. Come on. And when God wanted to share that message around the world that would transform the known world as we know it, he called a couple teenage fisher boys working with their dad and said, come, follow me. And we are living out of their obedience. When God, come on, when God wants to bring about a change, he often chooses and uses teens. So if you're a teen, if you're 20, it's not a someday, one day. I I just, there's a new label for you, chosen. There's a new label. It's not the me generation. You're the chosen generation. God looks at you very differently than the way others look at you. He's saying, I believe in you. And church, we need to believe in them. 
We need to call out what's true in them. Doesn't mean we don't call out the bad stuff too and help grow them. But what if instead of dismissing them, we began to develop them? That's a good place for an amen. You missed it there. That's all right. That's all right. That's all right. All right. So let me try it again. What is it? What is it the church can afford to let fall? Help me out. It's generation. Here's why. Here's why. The fate of the church rests in the hands of this generation. The future of the church rests in the hands of this generation, and we are the stewards of that generation. So if you're in your 50s and 60s, let me tell you why this should matter to you and why you should allow yourself to get a little uncomfortable. Don't you want to be... And don't you want to create a place where you raise up the next generation of leaders? Don't you want to leave a legacy where you pass the baton well? Where you didn't just sit back and went, I got to do my own thing. But I can look back and go, I've lived out a legacy. Don't you want to have a place where your sons, your daughters, and their friends flock to your church? Because it's not about you, it's about the next generation. And for those of us in our 30s and 40s, think about this. This is why this should matter to you. Don't you? Don't you want to create a place that your kids love for a lifetime and not just a time in their life? I mean, that that captures the heart of a child forever. I mean, think about this. Don't you want your kids to never have to experience coming back to church because they never left the church? See, that's what's at stake when we ask that question. What is it the church can't afford to let fall? And if you're in your teens or 20s, don't you want to be? Don't you want to be the generation that actually reaches their generation. Don't, oh, come on. I believe in you. God believes in you. Don't you want to be the generation that helps make the bride of Christ more brilliant and beautiful than it's ever been in history? And by the way, that can happen. There's more to, we have more access than we ever have in all of human history. The expansion of the gospel can happen more rapidly than ever before. And I believe there's something locked in a teenage mind like the next Bill Gates or the next Mark Zuckerberg, but he is here for God and he's going to unleash something for for this generation. Don't you want to be a part of that? See what's at stake. That's what's at stake. It should matter to all of us. I want to close with a, a psalm of Moses and kind of rewind. So we're in Judges a couple hundred years after Joshua. I want to rewind all the way back to Moses. And this is Moses at the end of his life. This is Moses where he is, um, he's about to pass the baton onto Joshua. And he did. He passed the baton on well. And he's, this is the only psalm we have recorded of Moses. And he, uh, many scholars believe that he's up on Mount Sinai looking into the promised land, the land he never got to go in. But by the way, <laughs> church, what, what if is the next generation is going to do greater things than us? Sorry, this is a little side note. What if instead of us doing great things, God put us here to raise up another generation to do great, great things? What if, us, what if those of us with kids, our kids are going to do things better than us? And just as my kids, when they're small, I put them on our, my shoulders and they could see further. What if we did that with a generation and we put them on our shoulders And this is Moses unpacking, and Psalm 90 is powerful. You should sit in it. The putting on shoulders for Joshua so he can see further. And he starts it out this way. Oh, Lord, you've been our dwelling place throughout all generations. And I love that. I love that thought. Think about this. Past, present, and future. 
And the church is the dwelling place of all generations. Would God allow this place to be a place and a dwelling place for all generations? And he closes it. And there's, I mean, there's so much in the middle we couldn't get into. He closes it this way. Um, And if you can bring up the next line so I can read it. Thank you. May the favor of our Lord, our God, rest on us. And then he uses this incredible word, establish the work of our hands, O God. Establish the work of our hands. That, that word establish, it, it means to prepare. It means to make ready. And for some, that question, uh, personally, when I ask that, what is it you can't afford to let fall? There's some preparation. You're in a place of preparation. And, and that, you're going like, you know what? I, I, I knew all that to be true, but... But that was a fresh awakening. There's some things you need to prepare and make ready. And as a church, some of you are like, yes, okay, let's get after it. I'm ready to get in. But interestingly, this word also means to repair or put right. And when I asked that question at the very beginning, actually, some of you, you couldn't hear even the rest of it because the reality is, is yours not midair, is it? Some of the most important things have fallen and they're cracked and broken. And you're hearing this and everybody like, woohoo, yeah, this generation. And you're just going, yeah, but God doesn't want me. God couldn't use me. There's no hope. You don't know where I've been. You don't know what I've done. And you don't know the people I've hurt. And all the things that I thought were most important or the people in my life that are most important, it's broken. Now, I just want to close with telling you how far God will go for you to establish, to repair, and put right the work of your hands. That, that all is not lost, and there is still hope, and God's not done with you yet, even if you feel like it's broken on the ground. Uh, last year, about this time, I was at a wedding in Carmel, and my wife and I got to be there for three nights, paid for, no kids. Unbelievable. <laughs> Uh, and so early Friday morning, we get up, and we're coffee snobs. We go to a coffee shop, and she's going to go out with friends and do the estate sale, garage sale stuff, and I was just going to stay and work on the weekend uh, message. And so I looked around at this coffee shop, and I'm going like, I'm, I'm a coffee snob, right? This place does not fit. I can't hang out here all day and work. And so then we walk down to another coffee shop, and uh, I, we kind of look in and go, there's no way. Okay, I can't stay here all day. And then I go to a third coffee shop, and, and I didn't even have, have to walk into this coffee shop. I just saw from the outside. I'm like, uh-uh, thank God there's a fourth coffee shop in Carmel. And, and so we walked to that fourth coffee shop, and I walked in. I said, at last, I'm home. And I walk in, and it's packed. And the only table that's open is one of those big communal tables. You know what I'm saying? And I look around, and I'm like, okay, well, it's open. I take it, and I get out all my stuff. But I'm realizing I'm that guy that everyone hates that's coming in afterwards because every seat's taken, and I'm kind of spread out with my books and Bible and computer and everything. And people don't like to sit down with other people who have Bibles out anyway, so that's a little scary. Uh, And... And so I'm kind of cognizant of this. And so I hear this couple, I think they may be in the mid fifties or so young couple, and they come in and they're like talking and looking for a place to see it. And I look at them and I say, would you like to sit at my table? Cause I own it. You know, this is my table. Thank you very much. And they kind of look at each other, talk and say, oh yeah, okay. And they sit down and the, the lady looks at my Bible and she says, oh, are you a Christian? I say, well, yes, uh, yes I am. Are you? And she says, well, it's a it's a long story. And then I'm like, oh, okay. And the guy comes back and they start talking. And I really quickly find out that they're not a couple, but he's her financial planner and he's done a bad job. And this is his firing. So, <laughs> so I put on my headphones about as quick as I can, try to butt out of this conversation. About an hour later, after I get done working uh, and they get done talking, I get up and get a refill. I just feel the prompting of God, you need to talk to her. And I'm like, God, I don't really want to. I'm kind of busy um, preparing for Sunday, kind of important, you know. I said, all right. And I said, hey, how's it going? Uh, Not too good. 
what are you working on? I said, well, actually, I'm a pastor. I, I pastor a church called Awakening over in San Jose. And I'm not even sure why I said this next part, except just that I'm really proud of where I grew up. And I said, uh, but I grew up in Santa Cruz. And she looks at me and says, uh, when you lived in Santa Cruz, did you ever happen to go to Chip Ingram's church? <laughs> I said, well, as a matter of fact, I'm his son. And I could have, I mean, I could have been the Prince of Wales at this moment. <laughs> oh my goodness! Oh, I'm sitting at Chip Ingram's son's table. And I'm like, yes, I do own the table. And, and she's like, wow, oh my goodness. And then the floodgates began to pour out. And she began to tell of this, she's gone through this incredibly painful di divorce and the hardest time of her life. And uh, I mean, at one point she even disclosed, you know, that she's had thoughts of suicide and that, that life was over. And I mean, she was, it was the coolest part. She's telling me, you know, in my darkest times, the only radio station I got out of my house was a Christian one. And your dad came on every morning and it just got me through the day. Sorry. And as she was talking, this refrain of words kept coming up. And I just felt like, I don't get this often, but I just felt like this was what God wanted to say to her. And the words were, all is not lost. There's still hope. God's not done with you yet. All's not lost. And so I told her, I said, I, I just believe this is God's word to you. All is not lost. There's still hope. And God's not done with you yet. And do you know, and I couldn't help myself here, and do you know the lengths to which God went to share that with you? He sent me to four coffee shops. <laughs> hmm. Packed this place out so that there was a communal table. We would be here, pre prepared a wedding long in advance so that Chip Ingram's son, the person who God has used in your life, he brought his son for you in this moment. And I just want to say, if you're in a place where you feel like all is lost, God's word to you, you have a God who goes to great, great lengths to establish the work of your hands. All is not lost. There's still hope. And by the way, if you're not dead, God's not done with you yet. You are still his agent, his child, his beloved. Amen. Amen. Can I just pray for you? God, thanks so much for this morning. Thanks for our time together. God, I pray for the person who uh, walked in this place and, and they're ready. They're in a place where they're, they're chomping at the bit and, and they need to maybe prepare and make ready. Maybe it's personally and they make, need to make some changes or they're ready to get after this generation. Would you give them the wisdom to know what to do and the courage to do it no matter how hard it is and God, I pray for the person in here who I feel like life's falling apart. Would you remind them and surround them that you are a God who goes to great lengths to establish the work of their hands, that you have not left them, but you are with them, and there is hope, and you're not done yet. So God, we entrust our lives to you and say, whatever you say, we'll do. Would you lead us? In Jesus' name.